What's up, guys? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. Welcome back to yet another episode of The Dig, where we talk about everything from volleyball, training, and life, and dig deeper into the story behind the athlete. And today's guest is Mark Burek. And some of you might know him as a professional beach volleyball player uh, from the AVP and FIVV. Also, the owner of Better at Beach YouTube channel and the volleyball training company. So, uh, uh, Mark, want to share a little bit more about yourself uh, so the fans don't know who you are? Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I didn't even know this uh, one little Instagram message to your DM would turn out to, uh, to something so cool. So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Mark. Like you said, uh, I pronounce it Burick. A lot of people pronounce it Burick, and I never, uh, never correct them. I'm down <laughs> with it. <laughs> uh, and I do. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel called Better at Beach, where we give a lot of what your channel does. We give a lot of free tutorials. Um, mainly, we stick to beach volleyball. That's why we call it Better at Beach. And there's a lot of applications that beach and indoor have with each other. You know, it, you can cross-reference them in a lot of ways. And then I run training camps and classes every day in Hermosa Beach, California, uh, with a great squad of coaches. And we just brought on a new business partner who just happens to be my best friend, Brandon Joyner. Um, he's awesome. So if you're checking us out on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, whatever you need, um, just check out Volley Camp Hermosa or Better at Beach. And uh, you'll be able to hopefully find a ton of free, good beach volleyball content. Yeah, and I, I first learned about um, Mark after reaching out to me and then checking out his YouTube channel. And uh, one thing I always appreciate about Mark through his content is just like me, just very methodical, very detail oriented. And you can tell that he comes from a background where maybe didn't always start off as, you know, the most skilled volleyball player, but obviously accomplished a lot being a professional player. And whenever I get that sense from someone, I always know there's like a, a deeper underdog story behind that. Like someone had to work hard versus just saying, oh, yeah, you just passed the ball or you just hit it, you know. Uh, so it's much more complicated than that for, for those of us who weren't born like LeBron James. So uh, he'll, he'll definitely share more about uh, his underdog story later in this interview. And now we're going to go into our quick set. So we got 10 questions. We're going to fire off. And you're gonna find out if he's crazy or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> just, well, yeah, a, I might be pretty good at hiding it. Then all right. Be, yeah. We'll see. All right. Ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Favorite volleyball player? Oh, uh, Todd Rogers. Favorite food? Pizza. Favorite music? Man, um, like acoustic rock. One guitar, one voice. I'm set. Amazing kill or amazing block? Oh, blocks feel really good. I don't get amazing kills. <laughs> <laughs> That's an I'm honest like a response. Kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite beach? Hermosa Beach for sure. Um, and I also want to throw in Manly Beach because they're they're like a really tie. Manly Beach in Sydney, Australia is awesome too. Okay. Uh, go to snack. Trail mix for sure. Favorite non-volleyball sport? Football. Favorite movie? Goodwill Hunting. Favorite song? Um, 3 a.m. by OAR. Okay. Favorite exercise? Ooh, hand cleans. Hand cleans. All right, congratulations. You survived yes. the quick set. And you What's are my score? It is 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> you're officially sane so yes. he is safe to check out all right um, now on to the more nitty-gritty stuff uh, we just want to learn a little bit more about you mm -hmm. as a person and if you could tell us where you're originally from and what it was like growing up there sure uh, I'm from New York City I'm from Queens 
Uh, you would never know it uh, by the way I talk and uh, and act now, but uh, I do have some some clips of me getting interviewed in, in high school where I had my deep Queens Rockway accent. Um, and yeah, it, the accent only comes back like if I get extremely angry or maybe if I'm like uh, in a pub back in New York, that's those are two times when the accent comes back. But there obviously, you know, there wasn't too much volleyball there. Uh, I did have a, I lived in a, a beach community called Breezy Point, and it's a really tiny beach community just outside of Queens, but volleyball there is, it's still non-existent, um, even though we got really nice sand and everything. So, uh, I think that's it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Queens, and then uh, after college, I moved out of New York, I guess, when I was 18, went to University of Delaware, then transferred to George Mason University, then went overseas, then came to California. So I've been, I've been pretty much out of New York for, I guess, 16 years now. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> been on the move for 16 years. And, and I'm assuming your family still lives in New York? A lot of them do. So um, my parents are snowbirds now. They do half time in New York and half time in Florida so that my dad could get his tennis in and my mom gets her time with her sister. Uh, two of my brothers are still in New York and one of them actually just moved out to Hawaii. So I got to visit him at the last AVP and stay with him for an extra week, which was awesome. So now I got New York, Florida and Hawaii and I live in California. <laughs> covering some pretty good bases. Yeah. And those are all great places to be. Yeah. So how did you get into volleyball? Uh, hmm. So my first year ever really playing volleyball was my junior year of high school. I was a football and baseball guy. And there was this... Uh, I started playing with some of the guys just for fun. You know, they... they they saw me during gym class, like, hey, you look pretty good. You know, maybe you would be on the volleyball team. I was like, no way. You know, I'm, I'm baseball all the way. And then the more I played, the more I started kind of letting it in my head that there might be a scholarship opportunity, that there were less volleyball players. And I also really originally fell in love with the people. Uh, the guys on the team and the girls on the women's team were just really welcoming. Um, and... I really like that, that sense. And I feel like I've gone through that again and again uh, in my career where I just keep finding awesome people that keep me in volleyball or keep bringing me back to volleyball. But so my junior year, there was this whole nonsense between the volleyball and the baseball coach and the athletic director because the baseball coach really wanted me. Volleyball coach was like, we invited him. We'd love to have him, but we're not like yanking him over here. Yeah. Um, and so there was a bunch of meetings and it actually, it was really, really stressful. Um, it sounds as an adult, like it's not a, a big deal, but I took it all upon myself. I was like, what is my best chance at a scholarship? What does my future look like? Cause I was pretty obsessed with sports and I just, man, it, it was like a two month process of me trying to figure this out. Um, and in the end, I decided that if I didn't play volleyball, I would never know what it would be like but if I continued baseball like I kind of knew the general path but I had no idea what volleyball helped so I did I played my junior year ended up quitting baseball and uh, did pretty good my junior year but got hurt halfway through couldn't even finish the season really and uh, the next year all of the guys on the team that had been there and welcoming and were like absolute workhorses uh, like me they had left because they were seniors and on my team, there weren't enough workhorses left. I kept trying to organize lifting and training and outside tournaments, trying to get my high school team to go and like play a club tournament, which we had no idea to do. Like my brother who had never played volleyball also, he said, yeah, I'll coach. What do I have to do? And looked like he had never played volleyball, but we needed an adult chaperone. Um, and we got five people. We couldn't even get the sixth from our team. So that was disheartening. And, um, I just kind of didn't want to be in an environment where the people weren't working as hard as I was. 
So I went back to baseball uh, my senior year. And then I ended up going to college for football as an invited walk-on to University of Delaware. So it didn't even matter, really. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so what was it like, like when, when it didn't, volleyball didn't work out, did you kind of have this heaviness like, oh crap, did I make the wrong decision? Or did you feel pretty good about that switch at that time? <sighs> good question. Um, I felt really, really good about it. Uh, you know, it, it's funny in like today's, I kind of look at politicians and they said, you know, you said this back in 1995 and now you're saying this in 2005. And I don't understand why people aren't okay with somebody getting more education, more information, and then changing their mind. I don't understand why that's not looked at as great. Um, so I did, I got that volleyball education and went back and I had a different set of people with me, a different experience. And I was very happy to go back to baseball, but you know, I, I had to come crawling back, like the spot that I had designated for me in baseball no longer existed. So now I had to change positions um, and become a different player and reestablish those friendships with guys who basically looked at me like, you deserted us, you know? Yeah. Um, but I knew that those guys were hard workers and I knew that it was a better caliber of athlete. And that's the environment that I wanted to be in. I wanted to be in a place where I was among the best or the good, uh, not where I was just like the best and the hardest worker. I wanted at least some challenge. Yeah. That requires a lot of self-awareness at a young age to even want to be in that environment with those type of athletes. I think most, most young people are just going to choose wherever, they're going to have the most fun or where their friends are or what they're comfortable with. So that's, that's, that's pretty insightful that you would even make a decision based off of that. Hmm. Never thought of it that way, but uh, yeah, perhaps, I don't know. I, you know, I, if I had a son or, or somebody young and they were 15, 16, they're like, no, this is where the hard workers are. This is where the hardest workers are. Maybe not their friends, but if they did that, I would be proud of them for, for making that announcement. So, yeah. Never thought about that. But, yeah. Because my, my motivation, when I, I also didn't start playing until my sophomore year. And the only reason why I played volleyball was because I got cut from the basketball team. <laughs> so that's, that was, it was a process of elimination for me. And then my friends were trying out. So I, I got really lucky with just – and I was a hardcore basketball fan. I didn't really play anything else. I did martial arts also. But you know, I lived and breathed basketball. I, I was just never really that athletic. So I got cut from the freshman team and it was devastated. I've seen your videos, you're athletic. Let's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that came a lot later. Once I touched my first weight and, and realized that I could actually control, like manipulate my body to what I wanted to do, um, which, you know, which you know, guys will learn more about um, his exercise science background. And, mm -hmm. But yeah, so thanks for the, the backstory on that. I think it's really cool how, I feel like I meet more people that start in other sports and then fall in love with volleyball later because like you said, the people are cooler. Um, it's, it's just more fun. And like even coaching in high school, we get a lot of what I call the converts. We get a lot of basketball girls or soccer girls that have been playing since they were sixth grade and they do one open gym and they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm quitting <laughs> everything forever. And I'm going to do volleyball. You know, I kind of, I almost blame, the sport for that because soccer that point keeps going no matter what you know uh basketball kind of similar somebody might get a travel or, or anything like that and if the ball goes out of bounds but all those balls about it's constantly alive so it's it's almost a difficult sport to fall in love with really young mm -hmm. because you're constantly around people who the point ends and then you just take a break for the next 15 <laughs> seconds until somebody yeah. serves um, and yeah, so I think it's, it's not as easy a sport to get into when you're young and maybe that might have something to do with, with why people find it a little bit later because they're able to be a little bit, maybe more coordinated. I wonder if there's a way to fix that with juniors and all, I mean, lighter balls, balloonier balls, I, I don't know. That's good. I've actually recently partnered with, um, someone who's part of the organization of mini volleyball. And it's actually more popular in Europe, South America. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great transition. And for those of you who don't know who, what uh, mini volley is, it's a smaller court, lower net, lighter ball. And 
it's to give kids the confidence to bump set spike. And even the point system is to reward the bump set spike, even if you don't score it, but they do a point system. Um, so they get in the habit of spiking downward and smaller courts so they're not just shanking balls left and right and balls are dropping. I like that. So I, I hopefully that blows up because that's – yeah, it is it is a fun – it is pretty discouraging if I cannot hit over the net until I'm in 10th grade. <laughs> yeah. That sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's kind of like the, you know, the baby court um, aspect of uh, if anybody here is a, a beach volleyball fan. They know that um, at the Outrigger Canoe Club in Hawaii, they have a baby court, which is a smaller court, very similar, lower net, and that's where they put all their groms, all the, all the little guys, and that's when you're, they're turning out incredible athletes yeah. from that one tiny little court uh, yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah. So you might have something there. It's like futsal in, uh, in football or soccer. soccer right? Everybody's playing on the smaller ball, Smaller field size, but you get a lot more touches. And yeah. so now Brazil just turns out world-class athlete after world-class athlete. That makes sense. Yeah. So did you play uh, volleyball in college at Delaware? I went there for football as an invited walk-on. Kind of a similar thing where, like, I had the chance to get um, maybe some partial money and some education uh, help for my grades. But the places that they said you're – yeah, you can start your first year in football. I was like, that's not where I want to be. I was, I was 187 pounds, you know, and I was running like a 5'3 or a 5'4. So I was really slow and really skinny and light. And I was like, if I'm starting as a tight end on your team, that's not a good thing for your team. <laughs> so I wanted to go to a place where I could put in um, – I was my thought process was – I want to go to a place where I earn my place as a starter by junior year. Um, so I chose to go to a bigger, harder school, uh, which was University of Delaware. And uh, my redshirt year, we ended up winning a national championship, which was awesome, a uh, national championship. Uh, and during that time, since I wasn't allowed to compete and since I had like weekends off when the team traveled, I was hanging around the gym, playing some basketball, and then there was some volleyball guys hanging out. And I was like, hey, I played a little bit in high school, went and messed around with them. They invited me to play on the club team or to, like, try out. I don't know. I had kind of a jock mentality, but they were like, yeah, you know, you try out. You could be, like, you know, on the B team for a while, and then you move up to A. And I was like, B team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so like, I, was, I was like, nah, you know, I'm a football player. I don't have time. But slowly, I eventually found the time to, to make one practice, especially in the spring. And then I really liked practice. And so I started coming because it was only Tuesday and Thursday nights. You know, I had, I had all of my other time and I was okay with grades. So um, I started playing there. And at the end of my freshman year, we went to nationals because I moved up to the A court pretty quickly, like I told them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, you know, I played a tournament and then I played a second tournament just on weekends when we had off from football and we went to nationals and nationals was just a game changer for me yeah seeing how many of your peers it's people the same age like 600 women's teams and like 187 guys teams so that was fantastic <laughs> all in one gym for one weekend and all battling it out and then at championship court i remember watching oshkosh their club team which is really good and there was this one kid who was just jumping and pounding and every time he jumped the entire stadium now went oh and i was like everyone was so fired <laughs> to watch him hit but he kept trying to bounce because he was like i guess showing off too much yeah. and so he kept getting block touches so he never got a real like thump but i remember just seeing that crowd and the energy and saying like i might have to do this <laughs> um and so that summer i decided to stop football um you know the sight of food made me nauseous because i kept having to force feed myself to play football and i was i was always walking around with two cheeseburgers in my bag um and a, and a jar of peanut butter just to try to put on weight so literally the sight of food because of how much i had to eat it's just it started making me like sick um i just couldn't put on weight easily enough and uh and i was too slow to play another position so 
that summer, I decided, all right, let me try volleyball next year. And I quickly got them up to uh, four practices a week and then uh, almost five. But then I got some pushback from the seniors and juniors. And they're like, uh -huh. this isn't football. This isn't <laughs> one sport. We're not trying to do it for 25 hours a week. Like we're enjoying this. And that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. So after that talk, my sophomore year, I was like, same kind of vibe that I felt my junior year of high school. I was like, these guys aren't willing to work as hard as me or put in as much time. Um, and we didn't have coaches. We had like a graduate assistant coach um, who didn't have a lot of time to give to us and we didn't have the money to give to her. So uh, that summer, I just started trying to find places to transfer to. Mm -hmm. Sent out a bunch of tapes. Everybody said no. One guy, he said, you can try out, but hey, um, you would have to transfer. And I was like, that's all I need. <laughs> so transferred to George Mason then uh, under Fred Chow. So um, he he's also an excellent volleyball player. And I think he's won the nine-man championship three, four, five times. You know what team he played for? I don't. Um, so I think it's a set of Maryland guys. Okay. Probably like a CYC team. Yeah, they got some solid nine man teams out there. Yeah, um, Jason Pick. I don't know if you know him. Yeah. Um, but just like good, yeah, good, good players. And he was he created a great environment um, where we were at, where we all supported each other. And uh, yeah, so I ended up making that team at Mason, and then stayed there for three years. Yeah, that's an incredible story. You go from trying out volleyball in high school, you know, and then losing a year, senior year, then coming in as a football player, accidentally discovering it, and then ending up at a really good Division One school, George Mason. Yeah. So they definitely saw some potential. How tall are you? Uh, I used to say 6'3", but now that I'm starting to beat people more, um, <laughs> I say 6'2". I say uh, okay. so I'm like 6'2 and a half. But it, okay. it's fun to be smaller and to beat somebody. You know? Yeah. Oh, uh, I know that feeling. Trust me. You don't take that credit <laughs> away from you. You're like, of course, if I was 6'5", I would be able to do this. Like, yeah. I'm facing players who are a foot taller than me as well. So mm -hmm. let's calm, calm that down first. Did you transition as a like an outside? Or? Um, I, I guess my first year I was – I wasn't good enough to play six on six, actually. Uh, the coaches took me, Fred Chow, because uh, I talked a lot of smack and because I worked hard. And he's like, I don't know if you have the ability to improve, but I do see that you work hard and you get the other guys fired up. So I'm going to leave you on during the fall and we'll see if you make the spring team. Mm -hmm. um, so I would go through all of the drills and touch drills, but when it was time for six on six, I had to serve against a basketball backboard and pass back into the rim yeah. for like a good hour, hour and 10 minutes while they were playing six on six. And I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, the worker part of me was like, this is my process. But the other part of me was like, I should be on the court with those guys. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually I came in as like a second libero type person because um, I could read uh, and I could dig. Passing was okay. And then the next year, uh, because of an injury, actually ended up getting to play outside before I thought I was prepared. Uh, I wanted to play libero that year, but I got to play outside. And then I ended up sticking there. But really, my whole time, I only wanted to play libero because I just used to love like some 6'10 monster just hitting his hardest ball on the 10 foot line and me going, dink, like, uh -huh. you know, a little smile after. <laughs> Yeah, um, but serving got to a good level, passing got to a decent level, and defense was always there. So I was an OH2. Uh, they didn't set me much, but my job was to not make errors and to tool the outside hand. There you go. That's it. <laughs> just, and just pass dimes. That's it. <laughs> yeah, if you could pass, you can get on a court. Yes. No matter what. If you're the best passer in the gym, if you're the best spiker in the gym, there might not be a place for you. If you're the best setter, still, like, maybe there's a place for you. But there, somebody might be making, like, better decisions. Like, the passer, for sure, Yeah, you will find your way onto that court. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's – I didn't realize the – I didn't realize that you ended up at George Mason. I knew that when we talked before, you you started volleyball late. and um, But that, that that's awesome. And then I think part of the advantage 
was is that maybe you didn't have a lot of bad habits because you started off with good coaching whereas someone that you know started out at eight years old a lot of experience but then probably spends like the next seven or eight years with some of these habits that weren't being monitored so i wonder if that worked for your benefit maybe i i would think definitely as a coach um because all of i, I actually just told my players this today at class uh, and i was like I think I might have an advantage in coaching because I've been through, I've consciously been through everything that you're going through. I was an adult when I learned how to do all of this. So I remember exactly what it was like to like feel the pain of not being able to do it. And I tried at least three or four different ways to try to accomplish it, you know, and do it better and then improve. I think that the people that play sports from the time they're just a child, there's a lot of that pain and processing that they maybe don't understand. So I'm over the assumption that maybe you have a better chance of being a great coach if you learn and dedicate to your sport just a little bit later so that you can really um, share the pain of your players, let's say. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So after George Mason, you said you went overseas. Was that for a professional indoor career? Yeah. Um, I knew that I wanted to play pro and I knew that I wasn't ready, uh, my first senior year. So, um, I added on some more classes and another minor and I, uh, decided to, to play that year out so that I'd be more ready to play pro. And that summer I got a call from someone who had graduated from Mason before I got there. And he's like, Hey, my team has an opening as an outside. I'd love to have you. And so I didn't even need to go on the bring it tour, which is usually the path for players who don't get offers out of college. Yeah. And so I played in Sweden my first year, Ving Walker's Volleyball Club. <laughs> That's funny. When I actually went on the bring it tour in 2010, I think. It's so and much fun. Even if you're not playing, like, even oh, if you're yeah. trying to go pro, it's just so much fun oh, to get dragged around Europe and play volleyball. And you get to meet other volleyball, like the people that go in there really love volleyball, right? Because I, I know some All-Americans that have just like, you know, I'm done or I, I, I didn't get any offers, so I'm, I'm not going to go. Hmm. But the people that go and bring it are like, I'm going to earn my opportunity and I'm here because I love it. <laughs> yeah, it was an awesome experience. Um, and was, what's funny is that I got my, I had two offers, one semi, both were semi-pro. One was from Sweden. Yeah. And the other one was from no like a, you I don't, it's just a bunch of consonants put together. <laughs> I, like, yeah. I don't even remember. <laughs> I wish I wrote it down. It was so long ago, but um, gosh, I think I still have his business card somewhere. But he was such a, he was like a, I think the only reason why he believed in me because I was the shortest outside hitter. And then other guys like, you sure you don't want to go for Libera? like, yeah, I love to hit, man. I'd rather like try and not make it than to go anywhere else. Um, hmm. But the coach was also a, a short-ish, like six feet, I'll say hitter, um, but he made it into like the Champions League. Like he played at a pretty high level, oh. so he won. He saw how hard, hard I was working. It's like you know, I can't give you a full pro, but we can develop you in our second division. If you get to our country, we'll take care care of everything. Hmm. Um, and the other one was like a A three Italy, like a ultra. What I call ultra semi pro. Um, and you know, looking back, I wish I would have taken that those offers. But um, so that's funny that you're you're uh, ended up playing in Sweden. So how, how many uh, seasons did you end up playing in Sweden? Um, let's see. I played my first year in Sweden. Uh, second year where I could have played pro, I got an offer from the top team um, in Sweden. Mm. And I couldn't take it because um, I busted up my shoulder and I had to, I actually tore my ab. Um, nice. so I had to get two surgeries. So I took that year off. And uh, then my next year, I went to... Oslo Volley, and then I went to Croatia the following season, and then Oslo Volley again. So uh, I guess two seasons in Norway, one in Croatia, one in Sweden. Two in Sweden. And then I went back to Sweden afterwards uh, to like end my career as a player coach at the first club that I played at. So oh, I was cool. a head coach and player um, at my first pro club. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Now, yeah. when, you, when you tore your shoulder, because being a baseball player, um, I mean, I, I guess I could work both ways. You can have a really strong shoulder from the reps or you can have a worn down shoulder. So uh, when you had those injuries, did, was it because of uh, 
overuse. Um, you know, some since you have an exercise background, I'm kind of curious what your take on that was. Like, was it preventable or was it just the nature of you playing that much? Now that I know sort of the biomechanics of how I started hitting, um, I think a lot of guys, uh, um, when they think I need to hit hard, guys always think they just need to hit harder, hit harder, hit harder. It's like, maybe you should hit one in before you decide <laughs> to hit harder. But uh, I know that I was always tensing my arm. Like I tried to be as strong as possible instead of like letting the loose whip just do the work and the stretch and the whip. So probably my guess is that I was just like, tightening so much on every swing instead of letting it loose and i didn't let my shoulder operate like it should have um that might have been it and i I, de I was definitely playing as much as i possibly possibly could like i was outside of practice i was trying to pepper serve and serve receive another two hours mm -hmm. like each day because my my mind decided that it, this is a math equation and if somebody started playing when they were 14 and they started getting coaching, all right, well, maybe they practice four times a week for like six months when I didn't for four more years. So I started like counting up the hours. I was like, if I just put in this extra time, I will be caught up. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about how long you've been playing. It's about how many hours you've put into playing and thinking about the match and watching video but you could play for 10 years. And if you play four hours a week, I'm going to catch up to you in a year. I promise you that. <laughs> um, I think, you know, Kobe now, um, unfortunately, but he, he was like the same way where he's in the NBA shooting hundreds of shots after games and practices. Like, mm -hmm. He had the same mentality. So, yeah. Yeah. Those listeners who feel like I was a late starter. I mean, that's, that's, case in point right there and an inspiration that it really is a math game. If you started late, it's about the number of hours and the quality hours and just got to put in more work. Yeah. And Somebody's watching Netflix. You should be watching YouTube videos. Yeah. Like right. You should be watching coach Donnie. You should be watching mine at better at beach and you should be watching match after match after match and just pausing and playing, pausing and playing and saying, where is this person right now? And a lot of whys. Like in order to the game, you can't just watch and be like, cool play. You got to say why and how did they do that? You know, where were they before they hit that shot and why did they choose to do it? Because if you see that same play from the same player again, later on, you're going to start seeing like, oh, this is a plan. This, this didn't just happen once. This happens every single time he's in that situation. Yeah. And that's why I say Todd Rogers, your favorite player, because I, studied him like so many players did and I found out that he won certain points with the exact same tactics every time and um, yeah you can get better even if you're not practicing you got nobody to practice with I think you get better just by watching videos yeah for sure yeah uh, Todd Rogers I, I used to watch him in Dahlhauser kind of when they're on the rise and he was always the most boring player to watch because he just made it look so easy you literally hang in the air, wait to see what you're doing, and then shoot it here or just hit it hard. I mean, his mechanics were so consistent, very deceptive. So, yeah. Yeah. So after you uh, finish your indoor career, did you immediately transition into the AVP and the FIVB, or was there something in between that? Um, every year that I played indoor, I played beach door in the summer. Uh, uh, as soon as I started playing in college, because I was like, all right, you know, I obviously mindset said I need to catch up on reps. So it was way easier for me to go out to a beach and find three other people than rent a gym or find like a church basement or something and then try to get like at least eight people. So I was originally started throughout my entire career, probably like the first seven or eight years. I was playing beach only to get better at indoor. Mm -hmm. Um, and then started getting competitive on the AVP, started like playing some qualifiers. And I remember the exact drill that I was playing in beach volleyball when I quit indoor because <laughs> I was still a professional indoor player after Sweden. And I had my dad setting me because I was, I got the opportunity to coach for beach camp, which is a Swedish beach volleyball company. Um, 
were coaching a camp in Turkey, but I was doing my own training. I had my dad setting me and he's not a great setter. Uh, so it was a little bit frustrating, but all I had to do was hit this giant square, a high line 20 times. And I was going to be done with practice. I was like, I just need to, to shot 20 times. And the year before the summer before I was nine out of 10 in something this size, like easy, but this was my second or third beach practice uh, coming after indoor season. And it took me 130 something swings to be able to do it. And I was like fuming and frustrated and it was just me and my dad, like no blocker, no nothing. I just needed to hit this spot. And he kept saying like, do you want to stop? You seem like you're getting pissed off. And I was like, no, I'm getting my 20. I don't care how long it takes. But um, I was somewhere around like nine. And I said, I'm done. I literally said out loud, I looked at the sky, looked at the ocean, I said, I'm done. And that's when he thought I was done with the drill. I was like, no, we're not done with the drill. I said, I'm done playing indoor. We're playing beach now. And that's it. Um, so I never, never turned back from indoor. Uh, that was the moment where I just never wanted to be like that bad at beach again. <laughs> um, and went, went full throttle from there. So, um, yeah, I, I could tell that um, you're a great competitor just because in, in life experiences, you know, they'll often push back at us. And those that want to compete see that as a new goal or a new challenge. And those that are recreational, and this is where the divisive experience is, you know, just kind of do that. Just, they just let it keep them down. It's like, okay, I'm going to move on to other things. So the ending of that story was not what I expected. You know, usually if that frustrates you that much, it's going to lead you to other directions. But you see it, saw it as like, this is like a new, a new life goal, a new challenge. So that, that's really cool. Huh. Yeah. I also, and it's funny the way you frame things that I say your experience, because I, I hadn't thought about them that way. But yeah, I guess it was uh, a challenge that I was just like, no, I'm going to beat this. Interesting. Perhaps, perhaps I, I enjoy the, uh, the pain a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. One of the most motivating experiences for me has always been like whenever I play and I see a three man block, I just love to just go right at it, swing as high and hard as I can. Right. And then I have a new team this year playing and then some other guys that never played with me before say, like, dude, why, why do you have this, this extreme aggression? Like, how do you have that much confidence to just do that? And I never, it's not a conscious process for me. I just think, well, I just think of, I think I just think of all the, the people that I told me I couldn't do certain things mm. in those moments, like those, those experiences intuitively just come out in those moments. I, I have these flashbacks of that. And then that's how I express, or that's how I continue to take on those challenges. Uh, yeah. Awesome. I have a very similar mentality and a personal slogan that goes with it. And it's, not like appropriate for, for public terms, but I grew up in an Irish neighborhood, very Irish neighborhood, and I got this angry little Irishman inside of me. And anytime I start feeling doubt or I start like wondering if I should or if I shouldn't, this little angry man inside of me says, <laughs> just F, do it, you F, P. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I put that in all my bracelets. Um, just freaking do it, you freaking... Uh, insert expletive <laughs> and so like that guy talks to me and I'm like all right it's it's time to rock you know <laughs> anytime you're thinking about like one more rep or two more reps and it's like it's heavy I don't want to do it like he starts yelling at me again and that's what uh that's what keeps me going it sounds like you got the same voice you just hear it a different way <laughs> yeah it'd be awesome if you had a if you kept a little mark in your bag or something that would talk that actually say it <laughs> 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 <Press it. laughs> yeah. so uh, Burrick is am I pronouncing it correctly Burrick uh, Burrick Burrick that's a uh, that's Irish yeah uh, no it's actually a made-up name um, my dad uh, his last name was Burchick and uh, the target of people calling him bird bird poop <laughs> Burchick bird poop um, it was like too easy of a target and he just couldn't stand it uh, and he just took out the ch when either when he got married or when we were born and so we are the first line of burks yeah that's a, that's an interesting story yeah yeah i think it's polish <laughs> um pretty sure it's a polish name but my uncles kept their name okay. um, and i've never heard it once out of anybody around them so maybe my dad just was sensitive to it <laughs> 
So um, after you went indoor, you, you transitioned to beach. And how long have you been playing on the AVB tour? And, and I also know, um, learned that you also played a couple FIVB tournaments for USA too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, it's hard to say how long I've been playing on the AVP because when I was just playing beach, I would, a qualifier would be somewhat near me. I'd be like, yeah, I'll play a qualifier. I'll, I'll lose 75 bucks. Like, why not? You know, <laughs> I probably thought I was going to win, but I was nowhere near where I should have been when I played the first three, four, five years mm -hmm. um, of qualifiers. But then uh, eventually with my partner, Hudson Bates, who was on my college team, uh, he's now the assistant uh, head coach at Ohio State University for the men. And we started qualifying. We started doing better. And then the AVP had a U26 tour. And we didn't think that there was anybody that could be consistently better than us um, at that age. So we started chasing the U26 tour instead of the AVP when there were yeah. definitely some moments where we could have qualified for the main draw. And then the next year is when the, when AVP went bankrupt. So we dedicated all of this energy into winning the U26 tour so that we could be automatically in to AVPs for the next year. Uh, and then the AVP went bankrupt and we're like, why did we do this? Cause we finished first, we did it. Um, and then it got like taken from us. Um, and yeah. And so I guess since then, you know, since I was like 25 ish, uh, I've been a main draw player. I'm always like right on the bubble where the main draws are much smaller than they used to be now. Cause now it's 16 when I was coming up, 32 teams got in. And if I think about the AVP now, like it, it, it seems to me like it was a joke to qualify when there's 32 teams allowed in. And now that there's like 16 and 24, it's a lot more competitive. The athleticism is getting bigger. Um, and better and stronger every year. So Donaldson's doing pretty amazing things with the ABP. And uh, yeah. And the only other thing was going international. So start playing Norseka tours, which is Norseka is North America, Central America, and Caribbean. So that's the continental tour where we play all of those countries. And then from there, I built my way up to getting enough points. And at one point, a few years ago, I was in the top 100 beach players in the world. Um, according to points and started going to the world tours and then had a bunch of injuries, a bunch of partner dropouts and haven't performed for the last two years. Like I've really, really wanted to. So um may hoping to make my way back up there now. Cause I'm still like right on the bubble of that main draw and it would be much more comfortable just to be definitely in for a long time and not have that stress of, do I yeah. buy my fight Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah. But, Man, well, good luck with that. That's, I mean, you seem to always have this, this endless drive to just keep pushing through and, and, and grinding away. So. Yeah, grinder for sure. I'd love to be a little more, little more winner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I, I think I made a post uh, on my Instagram the other day. It was like, you shouldn't be proud of how busy you are. You should be proud of how much you have accomplished. Mm. You know, people are always like, oh, I'm so busy. Oh, I'm so busy. I'm, well, you, you, you watched two hours of Netflix today. And I guarantee you scrolled through Instagram for at least an hour and a half. Like, mm -hmm. Are you so busy? No, you're, we're finding distractions instead of finding accomplishments. Yeah. So I think people can be better at that. And, um, and I definitely want to be better at that in my career. And I think now a lot of my focus is going into the companies like the, uh, the camps in Hermosa for Volley Camp Hermosa and building the courses for other players who went through that whole process of trying to figure out a game when they're an adult, like how do I get better? Yeah. Um, I think it's been a lot of process towards that. And I think I'm giving back to the sport maybe before I'm completely done. And maybe there's an argument to be had where I should have waited, but I don't want to, I don't want to wait. Um, I, I think I can play and give back at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what I'm doing to my companies. And I think he, you're kind of the same way. We're always been playing. You're always active. You're still coaching. And you, now you've got a monster YouTube channel, um, which is awesome. I'm so, I'm in awe of you and <laughs> how you've done it. Uh, 
man, thinking about how slow like our growth has been, it's taken us everything and so much generosity from people who are giving time and skills to be able to just get like the 5,000 subscribers that we have and uh, hoping that it catches fire soon, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm sure it will. It's YouTube is a, a very long grind. It's a very unpredictable when that initial spike's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, I think just, just being ready when that happens, I think that's the most important thing. You gotta, you gotta give me some of your Haiku fans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I think if Haiku ever makes like a beach, I wouldn't be surprised if they made like a beach version. So yeah, you just be ready for that. There we go. <laughs> there we go. We were talking about it yesterday and my roommates, like we actually watched the same episode of Haiku every every time before a match like when they're on <laughs> Logan uh -huh. Weber was like yeah no we watched the same episode every time before a match and it was like their their season championship or something oh man that's hilarious <laughs> you know what's crazy is I I haven't even watched it yet it's like it's it's high on my to-do list but then <laughs> but something else and I, I really want to watch it I heard it's so good but I'm like ah, I can make like another video or I can start developing another and it, it's just hard to to choose between those things. And I think, especially after I got married, you know, I, always, I don't, I feel, I feel really selfish when I take up too much time to myself. Like, you know, I, it's, it's, I, I, I love spending time with my wife and I just want to make sure <laughs> that's a high priority. And it's easy to like get into this, this zone of, of, of bachelorhood sometimes. Maybe you can coach me on that. Cause I, I can, I can go for 20 hours, you know, like I can just be making videos, like yeah. rewriting emails and everything. Yeah. Um, and I realize how much time I'm taking away from people who I like really enjoy just to try to build what I'm building. Yeah. I definitely could use a lot more balance and not topping out on that. Uh, right. Now. And I, I hope I can soon. <laughs> oh yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I, I could really go. Sometimes I'll wake up at 3 a.m. and I'm like, I think I'm ready to work. I think I'm ready to like edit six hours straight of video. Yeah. <laughs> And like before yeah. everyone gets up. <laughs> yeah. And it's like 10 PM and like, everyone's like going to bed. You know, I'm, I'm in a zone. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think that, the, that actually hurt me during like the first four years. I've, I've been able to be better force myself to bed and control my energy levels a little bit. Mm -hmm. But last year was much better. But the four years before that, when both companies were brand new and fresh and I still had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. I was, because we used to do Airbnbs. That's how we brought campers in. I was like, rent rent a place and then re-rent it to Airbnb. And I was up at like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., cleaning toilets, trying to turn over stuff for the next guest. And I was going into AVP tournaments, competing against the best players in my country, thinking, finally, a day where I can relax. Like, that is not how you want to go into a tournament when you're playing the best athletes in your country you know you want to be like yeah. let's go i rested for this i prepared for this so last year i got much better at it this year i've slaved during the fall and the winter so that i can find more energy during the spring and summer yeah i think one thing that i've tried to make a constant decision the last two years that i just still am not where i want to be but i'm trying to get just marginally better each year is learning how to say no and because when I see an open schedule on my calendar, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I'm like, I'm going to go do this. Four clients, my workout, a double day. Oh, I got time for a double day. And then, oh, I'm going to edit a video here. And I'm, I just I realized my natural tendency is like open calendar, fill it up, open calendar, fill it up. And I find a lot of joy in that. Like, I love working. But like you said, the long-term consequences, like relationally, personal health, you know, it does take a toll. And, and it, it does... I've been burnt out a few times in the past where I just, that's the worst experience. I don't know if you've, you've ever experienced burnout yet um, with playing or, you know, owning a business yet, or do you still feel like you can push pretty hard um, and not get to that place yet? No, I've, I, I never thought I, I would have gotten to it, but in the last five years, almost twice, you know, you put absolutely everything you have into all good and positive directions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you don't get the results that you want and that's exhausting and you start questioning everything yeah. so the two times when that really happened I ended up just taking 
a little over a month trip both times. One time I went to Costa Rica and I, uh, I didn't talk to anybody for three weeks. You know, like if it was a meal or I had to interact because I had to get somewhere, that's what it was. But I, I just took that time to journal and write and figure out like what was going on in my head and if I was still going in the right direction. And then I did the same thing uh, two years ago in Thailand when I had the injuries and like my back went out and I couldn't play. And I was like, man, I'm doing, I'm doing everything right. I'm pushing in the positive directions, but my lack of rest probably got to me. Yeah. And uh, so I went to Thailand for, I think, six weeks and really similar. I was a little bit more social, but I took plenty of time to just, I don't have to talk to you. Because when you're a coach, when you have companies, and then like I'm a professional, so it's, and you're a teacher, so you get it. Everybody's constantly trying to get your attention. Yeah. And I don't want to take that away from anybody. Like I'm so grateful for all of it when somebody comes and they're like appreciative of me, but I don't have alone time. Yeah. And I think that's more what gets to me every couple of years where I'm like, I need to disappear and just listen to what's in here instead of constantly it being a reflection of what everybody else is saying. Yeah. So true. I don't know how you categorize yourself. I, I'm more, if I had a, a spectrum of like extrovert, introvert, I'm definitely more on the introverted side, which is ironic because my occupations are highly extroverted. Yeah. So like I, I really enjoy just moments of just not saying anything for a couple hours and and I, and I love interacting with people, but you know, it's just personality wise, it's, it's pretty tiring. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, my wife is more extroverted. So I guess that's how we balance each other out. But I think that was really hard for her to understand in the beginning, because when we first started dating, I had to be extroverted. I'm not going to just sit there and <laughs> read a book. I, in front I, of her, I, right? I, you're the girl. <laughs> you can either be dark, mysterious and broken where they try to fix you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> or you can woo them. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't dye my hair black because it's already black. It'd be emo if I wanted to be like 100% introvert. <laughs> but it, like when she kind of discovered that about me, it was hard for her to understand how that even existed. Like my, my coaching, my, my teaching, my training. But then also how as soon as I'm home, I can really just shut off and like be disengaged and, and or just needing my time. I'm so it's funny it sounds like it's a sounding board because I, I do that too um I'll get home after eight hours of just being high energy for everybody and when I get home and then like now it's my time to hang out with my girlfriend and this is the time where like I just want to shut down for a couple of seconds but it's so not fair to her like why am I giving all of this to like students or maybe clients and then like she gets the exhausted me so yeah. Um, I'm, I'm working on that from a personal standpoint of turning it on for her because I care more for her really in my life than any of this other stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, figuring out that balance is definitely, definitely tough. <laughs> yeah. That's great that you're doing that. I think, uh, our significant others definitely keep us, keep us honest and, and I think I'm always appreciative of how supportive my wife is of letting me do all these, be like a kid and just <laughs> do all these things that are not traditional vocations. Um, and I, I really, yeah, like you said, I, I think I have to really make a conscious effort to like not leave my leftovers for her when I get home. Like how can I say no to maybe two clients today so that, you know what, I'm going to have great social energy when I come home and really enjoy our time together. Yeah. So, yeah. They, you know, they're all good directions, but we can't, we can't cheat the ones that are closest to us. Like that, that's not right. Yeah. Yeah. Glad to know someone else is going through it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, down to uh, the last couple of questions. Um, I'm curious, what, what are the best things about being a pro volleyball player? <sighs> it's pretty easy to be fit you know, to be in shape and, and stuff like that. But I, I also feel like probably professional athletes in the long run are going to have the worst bodies. Everybody looks at them as if like, oh, this is the epitome of health and fitness. And it's like the stuff that we're doing to our joints right now, less, less in beach for sure than other sports like soccer, um, football, God, uh, 
and indoor volleyball, you're, you're crushing yourself there. Yeah. Um, so to be a 35 plus year old in indoor, that would be like almost unheard of unless you're just a setter or a libero. Like it's so hard to survive that long just because your joints, your knees, your back. But we have so many legit beach players who are 37 to 45, even John Hyden, like 47. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that's pretty cool. Um, and the best part, I get to make my own schedule somewhat. That's nice. I, I'm still playing a game. Uh, I am not at the will of somebody else, you know, or like the only one I got to be better than each day is myself. And then hopefully that's enough to beat some other partners or some other players. All right. That's, that's a tough question to answer. I, I get to make my own schedule. I do. And I do what exactly what I want every day. And sometimes it's tougher because there are those supposed to's but I am not waking up for anybody else every day. You know, I'm waking up for all, all my direction, which really feels good. That's, That's great. And on the flip side, what are the, the worst things about being a, a pro volleyball player? Um, you start thinking down the road about uh, like retirement and money and kids and where's, where's that going to come from? some of the best players in our country right now are having the same like mental conversations. Like if you follow Casey Patterson, he's talked about that a few times, like, okay, his career is ending. Beach volleyball tournaments are not providing a lot of money. So a lot of the more in touch and hustling players are now turning towards content. And they're like, I can't just be a beacher because that doesn't pay the money. Um, you have to somehow engage an audience and find a way to, teach or help them or, or be an avenue for other companies to approach, uh, to approach fans. And then, then you can be a conduit and then you can like find some money for yourself. And the more you put yourself out there, the more opportunities you have down the road. But if you stay kind of silent, uh, um, companies won't really need to be, you know, chasing you down. And maybe then you have an audience that hasn't been listening to you when they could have listened to you. And then you don't have other options afterwards. So yeah, I guess I guess the worst part is just the financials. Um, but also one of the big things is your failures are extremely public, and I think that's that's tough. Is that you know when somebody has a bad day at work or they like lose a deal or something, there's three people that know about that. You know, every, every now and then a little boardroom where like five or six people know about that. When you suck after teaching people how to, <laughs> how to play volleyball for like the last 10 years, and then you fail in front of everybody else, you feel like you've let all of them down. Like your credibility is somehow diminished. Um, and that, that plays very much a bad role on your ego and you need to be able to handle it right. So I think probably the most difficult part, not the worst part, but the most difficult part is learning how to tune them out and not worry about what all the other people think and just be there playing and doing your thing. Because, um, yeah, your failures become very, very, very public. And there are a few websites uh, that I won't mention that they just – there are forums where – people find nothing but negative to talk about any player that they can. Yeah. And I used to watch them and search my own name and like wonder like what people thought. And I haven't looked at one of those in I think seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. um, I almost went into it the other day and then I was like, this is not going to be worth it. Even if they speak positive, I know what my positive thoughts are. I know where I'm headed, yeah. but if they speak negative, what's that going to do for me? Mm -hmm. It can provide like fire and motivation, you know, where you staple like, bad newspaper articles on your gym wall or something. But for me, it's just like, I don't, I don't really, you're sitting on the sideline watching me do something. What, what do you have to say at that point? You know, <laughs> so um, that's, that's probably to summarize like what the worst part is. That's it. I guess just mitigating your emotions with, with public failure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, 
for those people who are kind of more public, like Mark and myself, of just being both good and bad out there, it, it, it is a challenge. And I guess it's the same way how people, I guess it's a really far-fetched analogy, but how people treat like waiters and waitresses. It's like you never know what it's like to be on the receiving end until you've been there, right? It's like that's why it's always so important to treat people, everyone with kindness and respect. But it is very tempting to, we can get a thousand positive comments and that one comment that might not even be true, which is actually usually not true, just very poorly worded, right? <laughs> can really dig so much deeper. And it is hard. It takes a lot of conscious effort to just like be content with what you're doing versus what other people are saying. That, that, that's so hard. We posted a video yesterday called Seven Deadly Sins of Hand Setting, like mm -hmm. for beach volleyball. And we, I had this feeling, I was like, the energy in the video is good. We spent a lot of time editing it and we talked about pain points and how to fix them. And I was like, this is going to be the one guys. I think this one is going to go a long way. And so far it's, it's about like five times the rate of views uh, cool. as, time as any other video we've ever put out, which I'm stoked on. Yeah. But within an hour, we had 16 likes and two dislikes. And I was like, <laughs> ignore it you know <laughs> like what can you have disliked about this yeah you know like i'm spending all of my time so many hours every day to split 39 dollars a month between the four people like me my editor and my assistant and and my partner brandon like you dislike that i'm giving you something for free yeah. You know, if you don't <laughs> want it, you don't have to pay it. But it's it's just funny. I can, it's always been like, I look at people the way they talk about LeBron. LeBron sucks. LeBron sucks. Really? <laughs> you know his name. Like, that's the kind of proof that he doesn't suck. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like to keep it positive, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I still remember when I forgot my first dislike because I was on a roll. It's like, first 20 videos, oh, like 10 likes, 20 likes. And I got that first one. I talked to my wife, I was like, who the hell does not like this stuff? Like, this is not only scientifically accurate, it's entertaining, it's honest. And I was just like, I think after that, I was like, okay, I, I can't make this a habit. This is, <laughs> this is not, this is totally not worth it. And just put like scotch tape over that, over that part of the screen and just don't even worry about it. I think there's some YouTubers out there that are like cats genetically. You know, some, are you a cat person? Not necessarily. Okay, I'm me. Not a cat hater, but uh, I don't need cats in my life. My wife converted me somehow, um, and I, the nature of cats—they just do mischievous things for no reason. Mm. Like they'll look at you as they're knocking the glass over the counter. <laughs> they use so many great videos about that. So I think that's there's some evolutionary trait, like some cat DNA seeped into some humans out there on YouTube. So. <laughs> They're just going to click it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, no, there are for sure like trolls and people that like actually just get out of kick of trying to fire people up. And yeah. um, my editor at one point, she was just like, hey, don't feed the trolls. Yeah. Like the only thing that they get off on is if you have a response and you're actually feeding them and now you're giving them more material. Yeah. Like, don't feed the trolls. And I was like, oh, that's and you know what's crazy is a, an unanticipated effect was that I have a lot of fans that just rush to my defense. And I, I, I don't respond to any negativity unless it's, it's false. Like mm -hmm. unless someone says, oh, you should train your calves to jump higher. You know, then I'll say like, no, actually the research says blah, 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 blah. Um, but uh, even before I can respond, there's like 20 people say, oh, you're an idiot. I want to see your channel. You know, blah, blah. <laughs> So it's pretty cool. Thank you to uh, all my fans that come to my defense. <laughs> you, got, you got an army behind you. <laughs> I appreciate that, the Elevate Army. Um, so um, in closing, if you want to share a little bit about your Better at Beach tutorials and your camps of people's in Hermosa Beach, I know those are really popular. If you want to talk a little bit about that for those, anybody who wants to learn some beach volleyball. Thanks for that opportunity. Um, yeah, so we started five years ago, Volley Camp Hermosa, which we – started out running seven day training camps for adults mainly. Uh, we also accept juniors and everything, but I felt like there is a, some kind of lack in the coaching world available to adults 
I think there's so much coaching available for juniors and somebody could play for five years like we were talking about and just have no technique or awful technique and then they see a 12 year old girl and she's just dishing with beautiful hands and perfect passing and like her right left right left every time on her approach and I go you can't think about it that way because when you started playing you just started playing and you kind of made it up and you pieced together advice that 12 year old for the last you know for the first six months of her playing had somebody watching her for those two hours saying you have to do this right and this is how you do it right I wanted to create something for adults that would do the same way. So we started with the seven day training camps and now we run classes every day. So if you come to one of our camps, um, we have about four hours of training every day. Uh, it's only professional beach volleyball players or coaches of professional beach volleyball players that teach our classes. So it's people who are in the arena and have been in the arena really like showing you the best and highest level of what the world is doing and and what our country is doing as far as knowledge and technique um if you don't want to come to one of those camps you can come on any day and we will have classes any day if you just need a weekend and we get a bunch of girls who come from san francisco for just a three-day weekend and uh they get private lessons and you can also take classes but you can come on any day and visit us and, and just sign up for classes at volleycampermosa.com and We'll give you everything we have. And then for better at beach, uh, I decided at some point that what was my business goal and it was to help make a million people better at beach volleyball to some way, some little piece of information found its way from the way I disseminated it until their brains and, and gave them a positive experience. So better at beach became the platform where we would go through YouTube and then build online training courses uh, subscription plans where we have our entire video library uh, and we also do video analysis where if you go to my YouTube channel you'll see sometimes there will be um, videos where I'm helping a player with their game because there is so much value in studying and watching your own film and then being critiqued on it so that it looks and shapes itself the right way and when we run our camps our video analysis session when the players get to watch themselves in my living room they see that as like their best practice of the week. They're so stoked on it. So we always get people after the camps that are saying, hey, um, can we do a video analysis in two months because I wanna see how I'm progressing. And uh, for me, I pay coaches a lot of money to watch my film and give me feedback on it. Because if one coach can find one thing and fix that, that's not fixing one thing, that's fixing thousands and thousands and thousands of points for me yeah so i think people need to realize that with coaching like imagine what one private lesson is going to do for you that's knowledge for the rest of your life yeah that's not them like making an adjustment that'll help you in one point <laughs> that whatever 60 bucks 90 bucks 150 bucks in an hour that's going to give you so many more points that you win and imagine winning a thousand more points in your life just because of like one investment that feels good yeah. So that's what we do at Better Beach. Those are online courses in Bali Campanosas, the camps and the classes. And um, everybody is more than welcome. Awesome. Thanks for the information. And next time I'm down at SoCal, I'll, I'll definitely, I would love to make it yeah. to try one of those classes. <laughs> yes. Try a bunch of them. We got an open men's camp coming um, the end of March. So okay. it's just open men. Um, and we got a bunch of good players coming from Canada, Australia, Brazil, wow. and a few other places in the U.S. So. Okay. And if you want to oh, check okay. out, yeah, go ahead. No, good. Um, if you want to check out uh, Better at Beach for his online tutorials and also how to sign up for his Mosa camps, I'll leave those links in the description box. And what's your Instagram handle? Uh, mine is at Mark Burick, M A R K B U R I K. And our uh, company Instagram, the one that we do the most work on, is Bali Camp Hermosa. Uh, and you can find all that information in the description box. Well, uh, Mark, I want to thank you so much for taking your time and really sharing not just your knowledge on this uh, interview, but all the, the free content you have on your YouTube channel. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much time and effort it takes to write the script, record, edit, coordinate between people to help you run the videos um, just because we want to help people. That's the bottom line. And I think you've heard his story. You guys know my story about 
we both know what it's like to be on the sidelines to struggle and that's actually majority of the population like 99 percent um and we love to change lives that way and build give people confidence to enjoy the sport that we both love so uh, thanks again mark for for doing that Thank you. Thank you for being so open and answering a message from a stranger. <laughs> really appreciate that. Didn't know it would turn into this, but I'm, I'm grateful. And uh, yeah, hope we can do more stuff down the road. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, hopefully we'll see you in Hermosa Beach. Uh, if not, then we'll see you on YouTube. Yeah, you will. All right. Take care. See you, Donnie.